The mission of the CDC is to save lives and protect people from health threats. It accomplishes this through science. And one move recently that demonstrates this, actually making history, is when the CDC announced an update to its ventilation guidance on preventing indoor transmission of the virus that causes COVID-19. Yet, is this just about COVID-19 or is there a bigger issue here to talk about? So we're gonna to go to our experts on this. Today I'm with Patricia Olinger, the Executive Director of GBAC and my co-host on this episode of BioTalk. Also Dr. Gavin McGregor Skinner, the Senior Director of GBAC and Doug Hoffman, the Executive Director of Normie. We have some experts here today. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks for having us, Jeff. Good to be here. So let's let's get some thoughts uh, from each of you. And Patty is my co-host. Let's start with you. When you heard this news, what were your thoughts? Uh, you know, we've been expecting this um, for a while now. And, you know, it's not just CDC. It was ASHRAE um, coming out with new uh, uh, ventilation standards for the built environment. Um, WHO updated a lot of theirs for indoor air pollutants, and we're seeing this across the world on what we need to be doing for healthier indoor air and healthier spaces inside. Um, so it's, it was a, no pun intended, but a breath of fresh air um, to see these. But I think that this is just the first step to other things that need to happen, because now that we have them, now what? How do we use them? is gonna be the important questions to answer. Good. Gavin, how about you? What were your thoughts when this was announced? Oh, I think it's important to consider, Jeff, that we may be on the verge of something amazing here. Something that can be measured, can be articulated, um, that people can be educated and made aware of. And we're not creating a problem just to stay in business, we're creating a problem because indoor air is just not measured in public spaces, let alone in our homes. And I think what we're what, what's so significant about coming out of a three-year pandemic where we didn't really have specific measurements or specific standards that we could measure against. And everyone's confused. There's, you know, everyone's talking about indoor air quality. So right now, that lack of accountability that we've all had across society, not just in our profession, in our clean industry, but understand that if I said to someone, did you improve ventilation is really not the question I want to ask. The question I want to ask is, did you improve air quality by a specific amount? And with these standards from, say, CDC or the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating and Air Conditioning Engineers, Ashri, that puts us on that pathway of being able to measure. Right. Well, th thank you, Gavin, for that. And Doug, we have Gavin and Patty who represent ISSA. You're with Normie. What are your thoughts? Well, you know, I have a, a large building background. And so when I read things like this, I have a, a couple of concerns. One thing is I don't want people to get the impression that there's a silver bullet to this uh, this issue, which I think uh, kind of underscores what uh, Dr. Gavin said. Uh, it's a multi-faceted uh, problem. It needs a multi-strategic solution. And so that's one thing that concerns me. Uh, the other thing is uh, how practical are these solutions in terms of uh, doing them? What's the actual cost involved? I think there's some misunderstanding about that. But I think as long as you take a holistic approach, it's definitely a step in the right direction. And uh, I don't have a lot of, of concerns about what they've done. I, I just think it needs to be done in a holistic way. As, as Dr. Yavin said, the bottom line is you've got to be able to evaluate pre and post. What, what have I done to be able to improve the environment and can I quantify that? Okay, good thoughts. And any of us can chime in as you'd like, but here's another question I had. I was thinking when this was announced, what does this really mean for the industry? What is it gonna, what's it gonna do? Any thoughts there? Well, I think as Gavin had indicated, what one thing is that we finally have some targets. Um, I do need to, you know, actually chime in to what Doug was saying because this is not a one size fits all. And that's a concern that I have as we, you know, have talked before, Jeff is that, you know, I always get the, well, minimum five, 
five air changes per hour. Why? I mean, you know, having been on a lot of design projects for buildings and laboratories, it's always why. Why do we need to have five air changes? What does that mean? Um, with laboratories, what they did is they had an arbitrary number of 10 for many, many years. And then to change that, what does that mean? And can we achieve that? And it really comes down to, you know, one thing that they didn't, that I guess I was disappointed in the in what was sent out was they didn't really indicate the monitoring. And, and what Gavin had said is that measuring, we can measure now. We've got so many really unique tools that are now available that have come more on the market here recently in the last couple of years through COVID to be able to measure and monitor real-time indoor air quality. That's great. And then you can then start putting in, and it's really a layered effect. What is it that we're trying to accomplish and understand what parameters are there that are going to affect your indoor air quality, starting to better understand. Okay. I was going to back up a little, little bit behind that if I could for a second, Jeff, and that's just talking about five air exchanges, and I agree 100%. I mean, that's that's a number. But uh, the reason that you can get there is is when you've properly designed the HVAC system and utilizing technologies that are there right now. Unfortunately, there's a disconnect between the residential builder and the commercial builder, Uh Commercial builders always utilize manual J's, manual D's to design uh, systems that work pro properly. We don't always see that in residential. Uh, commercial requires certain types of uh, fresh air makeup, ERVs, HRVs. You don't always see that in the residential side of it. So I think it, it really, from a design standpoint, it can, absolutely can be done, but there has to be some changing in the thinking of the industry, I think, for the building side to make sure that these houses are built correctly. And truthfully, when you put, um, they were talking about a MERV 13, you can't just go out and put a MERV 13 on every HVAC system that's out there or you'll burn them up. I mean, it's oh. gotta be <laughs> it's gotta be designed uh for you know for the unit. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, you, you mentioned the residential. So what you don't know, Doug, is that a couple of years ago we bought a house during the pandemic, sight unseen. And um, there was a lot of maintenance issues that needed to be put in place. Well, I have an air monitoring a unit that's here at the house and, and my numbers were really bad. <laughs> and it's like going down that why we need to do that. And when the HVAC tech came the last time, I started asking them questions. Part of it was, what's my fresh air intake? You know, I asked all these questions and he looked at me like I was, you know, <laughs> Who are you and why are you asking me these very technical questions? And he came back and he and he said, ma'am, you don't have fresh air intake. And he goes, you were, this house was built prior to any requirements that required that. And I said, well, that explains one thing, because when I open up the windows, my numbers go better. And which I knew, um, but it's like, it's been a interesting, I would say, activity and I'm not there yet um, to look at what I can do and what affects my indoor air quality, um, whether it's cleaning, cooking, you know, painting the floor of my garage, <laughs> um, different things have a very big impact on the quality of the air that I'm breathing in my house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and Jeff, you can cut this out if you want. I'm not here to promote my book, but that was the purpose of mold free construction. It was how do I look at the house holistically and do the things that I need to do so that I can have an indoor air quality that's significantly better than how it would be otherwise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Doug's book on Amazon, only a thousand dollars. OK, we'll, we'll, split the, <laughs> we'll split the fee. So so Gavin, let's get your thought before we move on. They said five air changes an hour. I don't know if you would go with that if you'd like more or less or but it's all about the what it does. I assume every building's different. Five might work on one, maybe not another. Yeah, it's 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 just an important point, Jeff. And and I just want to make sure everyone understands I do have a signed copy of the Dark Often book. Um the book I have a signed copy of is Stephen Johnson's book of how we got to now. And if you haven't got that book, read Stephen Johnson's book, How We Got To Now, because it explores the history of innovation in the last 200 years. It talks about what makes us 
our modern society. And it lists as one of the six factors, cleaning and cleanliness as an innovation, as one of the six innovations that have developed our modern society. But that focused on surfaces. So that didn't focus on healthy indoor air. And I don't know where you sit or where you live, Jeff, but where I live, I've got a smoke detector and a carbon monoxide detector in all the rooms you know, rooms of my house. Why? It's the law and I have to do it. It's building codes. I have to do it. But now we have technology. We talk about these numbers, which is a great place to start. But we have technology tools, things you can buy that are affordable that we can actually monitor for indicators of indoor air quality. And it's a bit like, you know, Jeff, if, if I came home and I saw water on the floor in my house, what's the first thing I'd do? I'd clean it up. Course. Yeah, if I come home and I can't see the particles because they're, you know, they're, I can't see the chemicals, I can't see the pollutants, the contaminants in the air, I do nothing because I'm not measuring. Well, actually, I am. I've got six indoor air quality monitors in my house um cuz that's what i do and 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 you can see it they, they they give me real time information on things like carbon dioxide temperature humidity particles which are so important when it comes to infectious diseases carbon monoxide uh, volatile organic compounds i can measure that what's really interesting jeff is i can take my mobile phone right now and look at the weather app and i get real time data on what the outdoor air quality is in washington dc where i live and if I didn't have the indoor air quality monitors, I wouldn't have a clue of what I'm breathing right now. But I do because I have an indoor air quality monitor. Yeah, good points. So some may say the CDC was a little tardy on this type of move because the announcement to go to this five air exchanges, when they made when they made that announcement, it was the day after the U.S. ended its public health emergency for COVID. Were they a bit late? What do you think? Yeah. Well, I think my personal opinion is that uh, that they've been late in a lot of ways, not just them, but the EPA. Um, I, I think the the reality is that oftentimes these government agencies wait until they actually have to do something. In fact, what's interesting to me is that in the uh, EPA world, in terms of indoor air quality, there's really been traditionally just two solutions. Uh, the solution to pollution is dilution, or the solution to pollution is remove the source. At least now what we're seeing with what the CDC is, they're actually talking about uh, germicidal wavelength, UV, which is uh, amazing. They're now talking about increased um, ventilation in a way that it actually means something, that it can be quantified. So a lot. I'm, I'm really happy that they've made this move. It may be a little too late, but it's maybe better for the next time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and actually interesting to even expand on that a little bit. Prior to joining ISSA and, and, and GBAC, I, for most of my career, have been managing environmental health and safety programs. And so, you know, all aspects of EHS reported to me, and including the industrial hygiene group. And it's, it's not uncommon in big organizations that you have, you know, indoor air um complaints you know we have a stale building we have a you know sick building we have you know i think i'm being exposed to xyz and you find you go out you do that evaluation they do a visual inspection and in the past it was you know you did that a visual inspection you look at temperature humidity you might check the hvac parameters what kind of air exchanges was i getting even though there was no parameters to know what you know, is it as designed? Is it as built? Um, if you thought that there might be a mold consideration, um, I'd call in somebody like um, Doug here um, to do some some testing, or my team actually could do that uh, initial testing as well. But we didn't have a lot of tools. And now what we're finding with these new air monitors with real-time monitoring, I can be sitting in my office, I get a complaint, and if I have something I can be looking at what the CO2 levels are doing during that day, what's going on. And other countries have been pushing this a little bit further. Belgium, for example, in July, I believe it is of this year, all bars and restaurants must have a visible indoor air quality monitor posted on the wall. 
and their commercial buildings will have to go to it. I believe it's by 2025. The UK is doing following suit. So we're seeing this movement, not just here in the United States, but worldwide. And I think that for healthy people, healthy buildings, this is going to be a big deal. The balance is going to have to be, we're going to need to do much better of understanding what it is that we're asking of these buildings and making sure that our, our green footprint doesn't get hurt in the meantime. Mm-hmm. So five air exchanges, let's say I own a 25, 30 floor building and I have to do something to it to comply is, are we talking about law here and who pays? Like, is there going to be some government grants or funding or is it just on me? Do we know that? I think, Jeff, if, it, if it's your home, who cares? It's your home. So you're sitting in it. True, um, but you, commercial you live. Yep. So, so, again, but you should have an indoor air quality monitor there um, to understand that. So you've, just for your self, um, health and well-being and your family's um, well-being, that you're breathing uh, healthy air. Mm-hmm. For public spaces and buildings, uh, just like Patty said, there are countries that have taken this to the next level, which is where we need to go. Uh, in societies um, to actually measure what's there. Yeah, it's great. There was so much confusion and um, lack of accountability over the last three years with the pandemic because we didn't have a number, didn't have a metric. Now we do. You've got to go back to do you, you know, go back to the basics. Do you have an indoor air quality plan? And that's something that, again, I to say, GBAC, Normie, we're all working on with many other partners in helping public spaces, hotels, airports, restaurants, schools, uh, government buildings, non-government buildings, you name it, hospitals, come up with indoor air quality plans so they actually get a baseline. They get some data. That's that's easy to do. It's it's affordable to do. Um, If you go back to the number that CDC published of May this year, it is historic. It's historic for one very big reason is that we now have a ventilation target that addresses respiratory infectious diseases. And in my career, I think that's the first time that I've seen that ventilation target out there. But you can't have a ventilation target without doing 24-7 monitoring with baseline data, understanding how the air quality of the air does change as people move in and out, things move in and out of the indoor space. Now, Jeff, I think that part of the answer to me about the money is actually education. Mm. And here's what I mean by that. Um, When we built our house, I hired a a mechanical engineer to design the HVAC system with a manual J and a manual D. I let it out to three uh, contractors, uh, three, I mean six mechanical contractors to bid it. Only three bid it because the other three said it was two tons undersized. When things are built correctly, when, and you're looking at the house holistically or you're looking at the commercial building holistically, managing indoor air quality is actually less expensive than having poor indoor air quality. And that, from my standpoint, is a is an education point uh, that we probably need to figure out how to get into people's hands. But we uh, helped a customer build a house in New Orleans right after Katrina, and they, it cost them 2% more to build the house the way it should have been built properly. And they got that money back in two years. So I I don't think it's necessarily about the money as much as it is about understanding that you're actually doing the right thing and that's going to save you money. You know, the other thing I think that we need to think about is that more and more and more data is coming out that, you know, uh, and reports and talks on, we are what we breathe. And um, I saw a talk uh, by a physician, Dr. Mark Earth from the Mayo Clinic recently, and he gave a talk on we are what we breathe and and showed um, a lot of different scientific data and medical outcomes for poor indoor air quality um, situations. Now, that what we're finding is that when we are in situations of, you can call it a stale building, I think CDC referred to it as stale air 
that cognitive cognitive um you know thought processes are not where they should be you know we don't sleep as well um and we just don't function as well and we're starting to recognize the correlation between poor health outcomes as well and um, that's something that from a wellness standpoint we really need to pay attention to because it is something that we can't see and if we don't monitor it's easy to not look at it um, so it's a layered um, for me it's a real layered solution and that not one size fits all so it goes back to what Doug was saying is education is going to be really important here. And I think that we're going to see a lot of industries, whether it's education, HVAC, um, you name it, um, we're going to be able to pull together and really improve not just the industry, but also the health and well-being of individuals. You know, Jeff, we started uh, we started years ago uh, in 2004 and the environmentally sensitive individuals the population was about five to six percent. That's now increased to almost 20 percent. Mm -hmm. And in the trainings that we do for environmentally sensitive individuals, what we find in most cases is those people have spent thousands of dollars on doctor's bills. And when in reality, if you can clean up their environment, uh, it's going to be much better for them. As, as she said, it's absolutely true. We say this all the time. Either you have a good filter or you are a filter, but why not address it in, in the way that you can improve the indoor air quality? I like that. <laughs> okay, well, we're about out of time. I need closing thoughts. What do you want people to do? Like if someone's watching this, if they made it all the way to the end of this interview, what should we do? Uh, everyone should understand, Jeff, where they spend most of their time mm -hmm. during their life. And we know that you know, you just map it out. Um, you live to the age of 80. You've probably spent 90% of your time indoors. That's 72 years out of your 80 years. And I think the, the right now we're reactionary to indoor air quality and healthy air. And that's not what we should be doing. We don't, you know, we should be asking everyone the question, don't you want healthy indoor air all the time? And if, you, if that, the answer is yes, and we know we spend so much time indoors, then let's become actionable. Let's do something. Yeah. Well, once I buy Doug's book, I'm going to be educated. So well, I'm, going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to do you one better. We have a free class called IAQ Basics 101 that's completely free to the public, to the professional. It's a very short class, but it helps, under, it helps them understand how simple it really is to improve your indoor air quality. IAQ Basics. 101. So maybe we can get that link out. That's awesome. Sounds like um, education again, more education. And you give that course it, outdoors, don't you, Doug? <laughs> yeah. In some, I, in some houses, yes. <laughs> I Patty? think that, Jeff, I think that it really is. Education is, mm -hmm. is, is really important. Also monitoring the monitoring systems that are now available to us are, are coming down in price. And so, what used to be unachieved, un, unreachable sometimes for a lot of people are now becoming something that um, they're even talking about having units that can connect to your phone. I mean, literally be part of your phone in the future. Um, and But more importantly, I think that understanding that not one size fits all and that we do need to get more educated, but that we've got a lot to learn. Um, and as you know, Jeff, we're going to be working on a series of these kind of talks with different experts um, and also papers in, in uh, um, education uh, to help explain to people what this means and how they can make sense. They don't have to read the calculations in the ASHRAE standard, um, but what it really means. And as we start moving forward in the built environment, whether it's commercial spaces or homes, um, the, the long-term is to have healthier spaces mm -hmm. and we're on our way. Well, let's all go outside and take a Breath of fresh air, Breath of fresh air. Before, before time <laughs> sneaks up on us, as Gavin scared us a moment ago. Too much time indoors, but we do want the indoor air to be healthy. So thank you all for your time today.